Now once more I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. Welcome to the Restitute Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the Forbidden Land, the North Polar Region. And you might be asking, well, of course it's a forbidden land, because we're told by scientists and people who've actually been there, along with this very convincing aerial footage, that there is no land at where the North Pole lies, or at least where it used to lay, because there's debate about where the actual magnetic North Pole is. But we see that there are wonderful sweeping vistas and panoramas that show us how incredibly beautiful this land is. And yet, at the same time, we see that this is a tundra, or really, the very arid counterpart to a desert in a cold region. An area that has no life of any sort, nothing grows there because there is no land to support it. This is exactly what we're told is at the North Pole, and in this forbidden polar region. If you're going to reach it, you have to travel by ship, preferably an icebreaker, because you have to travel through a lot of ice if you're actually going to reach the North Pole. And we have many well-documented examples of polar explorers trying to reach the Arctic. We also have an inordinate amount of attention that's focused on the Antarctica, especially because of the treaty. But in this exploration, we're going to examine the nature of the Arctic. We're also going to look at the previous maps, which seem to depict land at the Arctic, and try to posit some theories for why this was depicted in previous maps. What exactly is going on up there? What's the reality? Of course, we're well assured by the mainstream, and they've given us very convincing footage that there's no mountain there at the center of the North Pole. But what's the truth behind it? What do we really see when we try to explore it? Well, let's start with a Google map, because that's what all of us have access to, and any one of us can take a look at a Google map. And what does it really depict being up there at the North Pole? Well, we'll see that there's no actual land masses up there, so that seems to conform with exactly what we're told. Yet, there seems to be some puzzling anomalies. For example, during the Cold War, we're told that the Arctic, or the North Pole, was feared as an avenue of attack. Hmm, isn't this interesting? And we have this unique little line here that's always appeared in the Google Maps. And there's been a number of theories for what's actually being depicted, but perhaps it's just merely an amalgamation of Google Images trying to show us what's exactly going on up there. Yet, no land masses. And we can see that it's in an isolated portion of our so-called globe. At least, again, that's what's depicted on Google. We also have accounts of a continent there called Arctica, but this was well over 2.5 billion years ago. That's a long time. I'm always amazed that scientists are able to use their ingenious techniques and methods to tell us exactly what this land looked like a billion years ago. I'm amazed that they can do it even 10,000 years ago. But these aren't things that we should be questioning. Now let's take a look at what previous depictions of the Arctic were in the past. And in this little document here, we see many depictions on how they illustrated the land in the past. And here we even have this odd diagram from Alexander's time, which looks very geometrically precise. We also have depictions from Greece, which, oddly enough, show what appears to be a circle or a disk. Although we're also told that the Greeks knew that we were on a globe. So I'm not sure. And again, we're not debating what the actual shape of the land is in this exploration. We're merely looking at how it was depicted over the years. What exactly do we have that's displayed and shown? And here we have this globe here that shows that there was a pin in the top of it. We've always had land, though, that's been shown, interestingly enough. And we'll be told that the cartographers at the time didn't exactly know what they were doing, or they didn't have the real scientifically confirmed observations and data. And here we have Mercator's famous map, which does show land masses around the North Pole and even a magnetic rock or mountain, along with other continents that we may or may not recognize. And here is that magnetic rock or mountain. So it seems to show a conflicting account of what's depicted and what's really present at the North Pole. Why exactly would the cartographers, and there's many different examples and many cartographers, depict land at the North Pole if there was no land there? If it's just ice, and the only thing you're really going to find is any sort of pressure hills that are created by the ice. There's no actual land there. Did the cartographers not know what they were doing? Or did they decide to take a risk and a chance and get themselves in a lot of trouble of what could potentially be an executable offense because they depicted maps that were incorrect? Indeed, we have numerous accounts of legendary lands that are up at the North Pole. 
lands that we are told and assured do not exist and are simply in the imaginations or misinformed impressions of the cartographers. And that's exactly what we'll be told. Yet when you look at this document and when you look at many other documents and books from the time, you'll find that the vast majority of the depictions of the North Pole showed there being land there. So what exactly was going on with that? Conversely, though, according to mainstream accounts, these cartographers who were so misinformed and didn't exactly know what they were doing were still able to compose maps that explorers during this time frame, the 14th through the 16th century, were able to use to effectively navigate lands. So, again, it portrays a conflicted and contradicting picture of the exploration alone of the North Pole. And as we look in more recent times, because would you be surprised to know that the North Pole was not actually reached by human beings until the 1920s, and even those accounts of exploration and individuals actually reaching the North Pole are conflicted. And I've always found this area to be very intriguing, and the other thing is the fact that we only have the North Pole being famous in more recent times in popular culture because of Santa Claus. Yes, that's how a lot of people know about the North Pole, especially in the United States where I grew up, is the account of Santa Claus. Now granted, the effect and celebration of Christmas has changed in the United States over years, and it seems to go longer and be much more commercial. When we look at satellite images of the North Pole, because I was trying to get a better look at it, we have our typical, very unique images that don't really answer any questions. They do reinforce the notion, though, that it is nothing but a pack of ice up there and there's no real land, although how exactly can you tell? And this official image from NOAA has many issues in and of itself. And then, of course, we have these strange weather images that always convey the impression that there's a strange circular presence at the North Pole. Well, perhaps that's just the layout of the land, and that's merely the weather patterns that were going on at the time. Look, this is from no one, it's from the government. We know that we can rely on it completely, because they would never make misrepresentations towards us. Although, I do have to consider the representations. There are many different issues that show that the land seems to be questionable up there. The weather patterns are very questionable. And even though it's just ice, one of my significant questions with the North Pole is, why did we always have such a fixation on it? What was always so important about exploring it, if there's really nothing up there but ice? And once again, we have in these other interesting images from satellite, there always seems to be some sort of strange circular pattern up there, a very precise circle at that. And we'll be told that it's because of some limitation in the equipment or some other sort of anomaly and that when they transpose the interpretations of the data and the telemetry, this is the result that we have. So don't ask any more questions and just accept what we're given. Indeed, we have many other satellite images that give you the impression that what we're told about the North Pole is questionable. Now we could always say that there's a reason for this. This is just simply to keep us pondering and speculating on it and merely to devote our time in trying to figure out exactly what's going on up there. Although what I found interesting in more recent years is how there seems to be less and less attention directed towards this area. And yet many of the supposed satellite images create more questions than answers. And isn't it interesting how when you look at Google Map, you just don't have a very simple overall image of the North Pole or the polar region. It's forbidden land, because there is no land up there. But people just want to explore it and go there. But remember, there's no land up there. There is also a conspiracy theory saying that there's a hole up there that allows you access to the inner Earth. And we're merely sharing all the things that have come across popular culture. We're not embracing any particular theory during this exploration. We're just looking at all the different perceptions that we have of the North Pole or the Arctic. Santa Claus is up there. There's a hole to the Earth. Well, would you be surprised to know that the very first explorer who officially and well-documented reached the North Pole, Roald Amundsen, used an airship to do so. And in fact, they're even talking about using airships to reach the North Pole now. Oh, and I will comment that Roald Amundsen was Norwegian, because it's a matter of Norwegian national pride that they were the first ones to reach the North Pole. Now, just imagine this, jumping on an airship to be able to reach the North Pole. Now, granted, they say they used the airship to help them reach it, and then it was a land expedition. Although there's a number of difficulties with a land expedition when you're going across frozen ice, because there's really nothing to sustain yourself on frozen ice with ice packs, and that's all you have for hundreds of miles. There's also the problematic interpretation as to the North Magnetic Pole, the Geographic North Pole, and the Geomagnetic Pole. Hmm, seems to be a lot of conflicting data. 
I mean, exactly how am I supposed to use my magnetic compass if I'm going to conduct successful land navigation to reach the North Magnetic Pole? Or is it ge the Geographic North Pole? Or is it the Geomagnetic Pole? Which one am I going to? I don't even know. Consider the recent show from the 20-teens called The Terror, which is a well-documented... <laughs> Sorry. It's a documented expedition to reach what was called the Northwest Passage, led by a British explorer named Franklin. And there were two ships that were involved, and the show documents all the difficulties that they had. Now, granted, it's a bit of a fictional account of true life events, or so we're told. The Franklin expedition was stuck in pack ice north of what is now Canada, and they were close to the Polar Circle, or the Arctic Circle. Although, conflicting accounts... You're not really sure if they're actually in the Arctic Circle or not. And they had all sorts of issues with their compass. And the show does a wonderful job of conveying all the dread. I mean, just think about it. If these two guys can't effectively lead you out of a difficult situation, then nobody can. And that's really what the show questions is leadership and the difficulties faced and some individuals understanding that they're in a land that's very hostile and is working to kill them. And the show very effectively depicts that. It also depicts the deteriorating aspects of society in a military chain of command in very difficult conditions because the commander Franklin simply wants to reach the Northwest Passage at all costs but he does have more experienced subordinates who have been involved in other Arctic expeditions and they understand that the land there is trying to kill them and again it begs the question if everyone was aware of this and if they knew this in the 19th century as these well-documented expeditions occurred within then why did they continue about with them why were they so obsessed with trying to find a Northwest Passage? Well, there's numerous different explanations given. It's for the fame and the glory of reaching a passage in very difficult to explore and traverse lands, or there's economic reasons, or what have you. And yet, in this particular show, The Terror, you get to see all the difficulties that the crew faced from these two ships as they were stuck in pack ice. The ships were unable to sail, and they had to come up with other means first to sustain themselves, and then to walk across hundreds of miles of this Arctic land. Although we're told they weren't really in the Arctic Circle, but they were close to it. And again, it depends. The show also even goes to a little bit of a mythical account of a beast called Tumbuk, or Tumbuk, who hunts the crew. They encounter an Inuit shaman and his daughter, and because of a misunderstanding, end up unleashing this beast, which also begins to attack and kill the crew, including the Commander Franklin. The rest of the TV series, or at least the first season of it, revolves around the crew's attempts to survive. They're being hunted by this supernatural entity, and they're also facing the difficult environmental conditions that they face in this extreme location that they're in. I think what this really conveys, though, is that along with the depreciation of a society and a military chain of command when faced with extreme conditions of survival, we also continue to ask the question, why was exploring the North Pole so important? Why was everyone so fixated on this effort? If, as you see in the background of these two characters, there's really nothing there. There's nothing that anybody would want. There's nothing that anybody would need. There's nothing that anybody in any sort of minded society that's based on materialism, as we're reassured by virtually every institution that we have in our society that we're all about materialism, why would people want to go to a place where there's absolutely no materials? There's nothing of value up there. That's what we're told. And yet the difficulties and the travesties faced by this expedition shows us that people are willing to put in this kind of effort and this sort of will to reach this location. Now keep in mind the Franklin Expedition wasn't even focused on reaching the North Pole. It was just trying to find the Northwest Passage, the waterway through the pack ice that's a shortcut to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and vice versa. And there's all kinds of accounts of other ships facing difficulties being stuck in the pack ice. There's even one extreme account of an entire crew being frozen on the ship and dying. Well, in the TV series The Terror, the crew finds out that there's no way they're going to get their ships out of the pack ice. They're being hunted by this supernatural entity, and they have to escape. And their only way to escape is to actually prepare an overland expedition to walk to a nearby base in what is now Canada that's 800 miles away. By the way, did you know that our well and famous Admiral Richard E. Byrd was one of the first ones to fly over the North Pole? And this was supposedly well documented in the 1920s, and this was a well-funded expedition. Although more recent questions from other explorers, to include uh, the Norwegian explorer, question Bird's sextant data and say that he didn't actually reach the North Pole. 
he merely got close. And that seems to be the recurring theme with a lot of the other expeditions when it came to reaching the North Pole from the late 19th all the way to the early 20th century, is that they didn't actually reach it. And there was all this scrutiny of all the data and the distances traversed, and there were numerous explorers who claimed to have reached it, but then they were questioned on it. So why is it we show this level of scrutiny with reaching this particular area? We have this obsession with reaching this particular area. And then we devote all these resources, all this time, and most importantly, all these lives. Now, granted, the lives lost in exploring the North Pole certainly pales in comparison to all the conflicts that we have across the land. But we always go back to all these conflicting accounts because we're told that the survivors of the Franklin expedition simply wandered around in this tundra environment for some as long as years before they all eventually perished. And from the official account, they just disappeared. And historians will tell us that there were other accounts with it. Although, if everybody died and there was nobody survived to, to relay an account, how can you know exactly what was going on? You have some very dramatic images, though, of the North Pole, which give us a conflicting account again with what we're told is up there. Now, we'll simply be told, well, this image isn't exactly from the North Pole, it's from nearby lands, and it's not the frozen ice that we have. Although, oftentimes, we're given the impression that there's a different account with it. Again, going back to the old Mercator map, which shows the presence of a magnetic rock at the very center. And we know, or we're told, <laughs> remember, the difference between what we know and what we're told, is that there is a north magnetic pole up there. Now, did the compasses work on that? Is the pole drifting because of a factor, a factor of change, or even just a change in the timeline? We're not really sure. We also have strange photos of these explorers who claim to have reached it, and yet somehow they seem to have brought rock with them that they could build up this little monument to put a flag in. And of course, this will be told to us that no, they didn't actually reach the North Pole, they weren't anywhere close to it, and they just wanted to claim that they were for the fame and fortune that came along with it. There's also other depictions, though, that give you the impression that there's much more going on in these isolated lands than first meets the eye. Now, when you compare and contrast everything that we're told, so let's recount so far. We have Google images that show us that there's nothing there. There is no land. We have older maps that shows us that there is indeed land, that there are even accounts of other individuals and species of people. We even have the ongoing myth of Santa Claus. And, of course, we're going to explore the myth of the origins of Santa Claus and know it's not the happy story that we like to believe. This is the book, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, written by L. Frank Baum, who was also the author of The Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. This was uh, recently adapted into a Rankin and Bass special in the 1980s that I remember watching, and it was very well done, and it featured the voice actors from the TV show The Thundercats at the time. And it was quite an interesting story because it seemed to have a bit more of an old world feel to it when it talked about the actual origin of Santa Claus. Indeed, in the story, there's even an account of giants from Tartary that serve an evil force. Now, granted, this is Tartary, not Tartaria, but the similarity in wording is quite interesting. And also the sort of omnipresent myth that you have that's conveyed in this world. So if you have the means to watch this special, and of course I'm talking about the 1980s special, I would suggest looking at it and get an idea of what it depicts. Now back to the North Pole, you're almost kind of surprised that they don't actually have an image like this and just say, yeah, there's actually a pole at the North Pole. Now of course that's merely a concept of comedy, and we'll be expected to believe that, but... Yet, that's what's put in popular perceptions. That's what's put in our minds. So, why exactly does that image persist? Because, is it important or isn't it? Is there land up there? Or, if it's just ice sheets, then why in the heck did everybody care about getting there? So, we could say we went to the North Pole, of course. We were looking for fame and fortune. And famous families like the Rockefellers were willing to fund us. Yes, of course. It's always that explanation, isn't it? You'd want to go to a very terrifying place where you've got decades or over hundreds of years of explorers dying there, but we're going to be the ones to do it. We also have the change that we're always told about the actual amount of ice up there and the amount of pack ice, and we're told that changing conditions in our environment are causing this uh, pack ice to either recede or change in its nature, and that's also having an effect of what's going on up there, and you can find no shortage of well-documented and scientifically researched articles that'll tell us all this. 
Although again, it just becomes hard to actually see for yourself if you're just any random individual who's trying to research the North Pole, what exactly is going on up there. You have a lot of accounts and you have different scientists saying different things. You have different political entities saying different things and it's either used as something to motivate the great exploration in the hearts of people or to convey the concept of concern and fear. Now, I can't imagine why anybody would want to be con conveying concern and fear when it comes to this area. There's even other myths that seem to accompany the North Pole. And what I find interesting when we were looking at that map earlier of all the different depictions of what it looked like over the years is that you go all the way back to the time of Alexander the Great, supposedly, and they were visualizing what the North Pole looked like. And again, this is what we'll be told. It's just pack ice. That ships have to be specially equipped and they have to have icebreakers if they're actually going to get through this pack ice and use the proverbial slash actual Northwest Passage. And it doesn't matter how many issues or challenges that these explorers faced over the years and to this day, we're told that this was a very strategic area. And in fact, during the Cold War, there was a concern by both sides, the Soviet Union and the United States, that the other side would use it as a primary axis of advance for land forces, <laughs> yes, that was actually a concern, or much more likely a ballistic missile attack because a trajectory of a missile being fired over the so-called top of the earth would be the most expeditious way to lob your ballistic missiles at each other. And so therefore, there was a great effort, at least on the United States side, and I'm sure there was a similar effort on the Soviet Union side, to build early warning bases, ballistic missile early warning bases. And we'll be exploring this effort because it's quite intriguing the amount of resources that both nations devoted towards securing this area. And indeed, Admiral Richard E. Byrd's explorations of both the Arctic and then subsequent Antarctica revolved around concerns about attacks supposedly from these areas. Although we quickly got a treaty in 1960 in the Antarctica, even though we're told that the Cold War was at its most difficult period because of recent events with Francis Gary Powers and the U-2 being shot down. Now, back to the North Pole, you have other maps, and the National Geographic Society has always been very well affiliated with its explorations and scientific publications concerning the North Pole. Indeed, they were the ones who documented Admiral Byrd's little flight up there, and then subsequently questioned that they didn't verify his data in the 1990s. What exactly does it really look like up there, though? If we simply accept these images, then that's fine, then there's nothing up there. It's merely pack ice, and why is everyone so concerned with pack ice? Or better question, why was everyone so concerned in the past with exploring simple pack ice? Why was it such a big deal to go up here to this pole that's really just a pin in a map in pack ice? Just to say that you were at the top of the world, the top of the globe, or the top of whatever the realm is really shaped like? See, that's always the thing. It generates more questions than answers, because... If it's a globe, and if there's nothing more up there than pack ice, then why should anybody care? Yes, of course, you can just say Santa Claus is up there, and he's working in his shop with his elves, and everyone's going to get their gifts on time. And don't forget that we're going to keep celebrating Christmas earlier every single year. Or, I'm sorry, the holidays. Let me make sure I use the proper term now in the United States, if you know what I mean. But it really doesn't matter, because it all comes down to what are the perceptions to the North Pole, what do we really see when we go up there, and what are we actually trying to explore? And here is the most compelling evidence. It goes back to the Mercator map. There were too many maps and there were too many illusions that tell us that there was land up there to be ignored. Now, could there be some other explanation for why these map makers depicted land up there? And it's very true that if these map makers made mistakes and other explorers came back and said, hey, look, there's no land up there, what do you think would have happened to these map makers? They probably would have faced death or much worse, at least if we're to believe the social mores at the time in Europe. And granted, this was during the Renaissance, although one thing that was not challenged during the Renaissance was the absolute authority of monarchs. And do you think a monarch would allow themselves to be made a fool by some cartographer that made a mistake? No, absolutely not. We go back to the depiction of Mount Miru, or the central mountain of the world, or the cosmos, depending on your vision or view of it. Or is it really just some sort of central terrain feature in the land? That seems to be a theory for what's being depicted, especially in the Mercator map of the North Pole. Now, of course, again, this will be dismissed, and we'll be told by our official scientific figures of authority that there's nothing up there. They assure us that it's just ice, and that may well be but there's too many conflicting accounts to simply ignore this. 
and we've explored the whole concept of Mount Meru as the center of cosmology when we looked at the beautiful architecture in Southeast Asia, including the Temple of Wat Arun, which in and of itself the central praying is supposed to be a depiction of this incredible mountain. This incredible mountain which is at the center of all things. Is it just simply a mountain, or is it a nexus point of some sort? Is the real nature of the land really so based upon the shape of it, or the actual existence and nature of it? Oftentimes it seems as though many forces want to compel us to simply embrace a belief, and simply hold on to that belief, no matter what sort of countering evidence that we see. How do you know exactly what's a fact and what's merely suggested as a fact? Is there a difference? Are there any true facts? A lot of people have a great deal of difficulty existing in a state of ambiguity. And yet at the same time, the depictions of this incredible mountain at the very center of all things, the center of the land. Is there really a center of the land? Whether it's shaped like a ball, a flat, or a flat plane, or something even else being curved in ways that we don't understand or ways that we can't perceive? Or is it all just talk? Maybe it is exactly as we see it. We just don't know and I certainly invite you to share in the comments what you think the shape of the land is or what the nature of the land is because it's a lot more than just considering the shape. When we consider the ways that the cosmological example of Mount Miru show us that there is an actual center point of all things. Is there really a center? Is there a nexus? Is this a location where many different realms of existence are actually possible? Or is it simply as we're told, it's simply a pack of ice that really doesn't have any importance to it? Well, if it is, it certainly does not reflect well on all the effort and all the expeditions that were launched to actually reach and find the North Pole, not to mention all the great difficulty that explorers encountered. But really what this revolves is thinking outside of the categorized thinking patterns that we often encounter each day. You're looking at things with a very different perspective. You're starting to open up your mind to different possibilities. Now, a lot of people do not want to do this. A lot of people will do anything and everything to resist even trying to consider other possibilities because that's what we're supposed to do. It should also be noted that there are many appearances of the name Mount Meru and many different associations with it across the land. So it's so important because it represents the center of all things. Is the cosmological interpretation at the heart of Buddhism correct? I don't know. I really don't know. But I think it's something important to consider because if there is a center point or nexus in the land, perhaps there is some sort of knowledge that we can glean that can help us in our understanding of our present situation. There's a lot of conflicting theories that this may really be going off into left field. And perhaps you may see this exploration as being out there. And that's okay because sometimes you really have to go out there to ponder the possibilities. And if you're not willing to do it, then you're limiting yourself. And if you decide to limit yourself, well, then that's completely your choice. As I've always said, I'm not here to tell people what to think. I'm just here to present alternate forms of perception. And this is one of the most radical alternate forms of perception, and yet in some strange way, shape, or form, it seems to answer all the conflicting accounts and questions that we have. Now, it could merely be a coincidence, but once again, that's a lot of coincidence. I leave it to you. What do you think? What's really going on up there? What's the real nature of it? Is it just pack ice, or is it something more? Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.